This is really a magical incantation to wipe the board clean of whatever you might have done on Earth. The ancient Egyptians left an enduring imprint on history. Researchers diving into the enigmatic depths of this civilization have brought to light the exceptional creativity and ingenuity that distinguished them. Certain discoveries have left us in awe, among them a 5,000-year-old book. This age-old manuscript, called the Book of Enoch, holds the key to unraveling a bone-chilling message about humanity. What untold tales about our existence lie within its ancient pages, waiting to reshape our understanding of the past? What horrifying truths about our past and future does it hold? Join us as we delve into the enigmatic world of the 5,000-year-old book found in Egypt that revealed a horrifying message about humanity. In the course of human history, fragments of a biblical scroll alongside various relics have been unearthed in the desert caves of Israel. Over time, many mythical narratives have seized our imaginations, featuring tales of divine angels, colossal giants, and catastrophic disasters. While these stories may initially appear captivating and enigmatic, a closer examination unveils an alternative strand of human history that often goes unnoticed. And it seems like the more they continue to suppress this information, try to keep it from getting out, the more it's exploding out. More and more people are hearing about it. More and more people are asking questions about it. More and more people are looking it up, trying to research it. <laughs> it, it feels like they tried, but it's getting out. One of these extraordinary narratives is embedded in the ancient Hebrew apocalyptic text the Book of Enoch. Traditionally ascribed to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, this ancient work unravels astonishing revelations concerning the origins of evil, the mysterious fallen angels, the mighty Nephilim, the cataclysmic flood, the prophesied Messiah, and the imminent end times. But how was this book discovered? In the latter part of 1946, or the early months of 1947, Young Bedouin shepherds near the ancient settlement of Qumran, on the northwestern shores of the Dead Sea, now within the West Bank, encountered a peculiar incident. While tending to their flock, one of the shepherds accidentally dislodged a rock in a cliff crevice, producing a surprising and resonant sound. Intrigued, they ventured into the cave from which the sound emanated and stumbled upon a collection of sizable clay vessels. Seven of these vessels contained a treasure trove of leather scrolls and papyrus. These scrolls, later obtained by an antiquities dealer, eventually came into the possession of various scholars who determined their age to be over 2,000 years old. This discovery quickly captured the attention of both treasure hunters and archaeologists. Over the subsequent years, Tens of thousands of additional scroll fragments were unearthed in ten adjacent caves known as the Qumran Caves, comprising a remarkable collection of between 800 and 900 priceless texts. The Book of Enoch stood out within this collection, segmented into five distinct books. The Book of Parables, the Book of Vigils. This is really a magical... <laughs> like they say, man, it always finds a way. Truth, answers, whatever it is you're looking for, life, it always seems to find a way. Behind the barbed wire of Korea's demilitarized zone sits a tiny village. This village represents the hope of one day reunifying the Korean peninsula. Nestled in the heart of what's otherwise a no man's land. <laughs> Here, a community of South Koreans live in the shadow of their enemy, North Korea. As young people shun a life of semi-captivity, its numbers are dwindling, along with the hope Korea will ever be reunified. Mm. Our journey into the demilitarized zone begins at dawn. We pass checkpoint after checkpoint, accompanied by Commander Chris Mercado. 
Freedom Main, this is Freedom Six, over. See this kind of blue archway and the white sign beyond it? We're now entering the demilitarized zone. This is the most militarized border in the world. Hundreds of rounds of artillery point in both directions. And securing this level of access is incredibly rare. To our left and to our right, we have active minefields. There's more than two million mines inside of the DMZ. Jeez. Freedom Maine, Freedom Maine, this is Freedom 3. As we drive towards North Korea, we reach a small cluster of homes. This is the village of Tiersung, home to 138 people, many now in their 60s and over. Kim dong Rae was here long before the Korean War would decide the village's peculiar fate. Communist troops have invaded southern Korea. A set of documents is signed by General Harrison. When a ceasefire brought an end, they lived through that and still remained with hopes that one day things could be peaceful, both sides. Like, how is that any way to live, man? Your entire life is, is designed on hoping that one day it's got to be like super, super miserable to live like that. But all they know is it's home. So where else are they going to go? Into the fighting, the demilitarized zone was created to keep the two warring armies apart. All the villages inside this two and a half mile wide buffer zone were cleared. But Tiersong was allowed to remain, along with a village to the north, to serve as a symbol of peace and hope that one day Korea would be reunified. <laughs> Dong Rei's husband was shot in the stomach by North Korean soldiers and later died from his injury leaving her to raise their six children in a mm. perpetual state of high alert. There are no shops, restaurants or medical facilities here and Dong Rei's life has been stressful and lonely. What do you leave the village for these days? The residents... Look at how she has to farm and do things with an armed guard right there. How is that any way to live, man? Look at that. It's farm for their living. With extreme isolation comes an abundance of land. <laughs> Do you pay much attention to whether relations between North and South Korea are good or bad? The village is secured by an elite battalion of soldiers from the United Nations Command, a US-led army made up of soldiers from more than a dozen countries. They're supported by South Korean troops. USA, number one. That's right. Okay. The villagers are grateful for their protection, and these displays of affection are common. From the roof of the town hall, we get a clear view into North Korea. So from where we're at right now, we can see from left to right and right to left, a heavily wooded area denotes the border between North and South Korea. There are no fences, there are no barriers, and there are no walls that separate North and South. So there is nothing 
to physically stop the North Koreans from walking over into this village here. Except for us. Except for you. That's right. North Korea has also been allowed to keep one village inside the DMZ, the village of Kijom. Though no one is thought to live there now. Given the North Koreans have decided to abandon this village and they don't have people living there, why do you keep people living here at such obvious cost to you guys and such risk? Many people believe that both Taesongdong and Gijongdong exist in the hope of one day reunifying the Korean Peninsula. Failing that, perhaps one day it could pave the way for the normalization of relations between the two Koreas. What would happen if it disappeared? It would be a very strong symbol, right? That, uh, that the terms of the armistice are no longer being enforced. As we're preparing to move on, we're alerted to a threat. We were planning just now just to walk up here a couple of hundred meters to a field closer to the North Korean border. But we've just found out in the last half hour that a group of North Koreans have defected directly down here to the south. And so we've just been told by the security team here that it's too dangerous to go there because the North Korean guards, it's likely are gonna be on high alert. And it is a reminder that although in some ways this village feels very peaceful, the situation is incredibly unpredictable. Given the risks, it might seem strange anyone would choose to live here. That's what I was about to say. Nobody deserves to have to live like that. And they've been living like that since forever. Like, why does somebody have to? That's, that's sad, man. But those who were born here, like Park Pil Sun, have their history sewn into this land. The ceasefire line cut him off from his brother. <laughs> Did you ever think that 70 years later, North and South Korea would still be divided? Why have you stayed living in the village all these years? The villagers are under no obligation to live here. Habit and necessity are the reasons so many have stayed put, rather than a belief in the role they're playing. Once the risk from the defection has gone, we're taken out to the fields bordering North Korea. This is designated a high-risk field, meaning these armed soldiers must stand guard while the resident harvests the last of his season's rice. The village mayor takes us as close to the border as we can get. What's that we can hear now? Like you said, it like they said, it looks peaceful. It looks quiet. It looks like a place where you can go and just relax. And but you can't. You're always on guard. Every little sound, every little creak, every little thing that you hear. You're wondering, oh, is something about to go down? Something about to happen? Residents are on the front line of escalating tensions between the North and South. Earlier this year, North Korea branded the South its number one enemy and said reunification was no longer possible. 
both sides have increased their military presence inside the DMZ, meaning the villagers are offered some serious perks to persuade them to stay here. They don't pay taxes or rent or serve in the military. Opportunities of modern day South Korea. <laughs> Yoon Kyung is Mr. Kim's third daughter. She left as a teenager to go to school and never came back. Has it been sad for you over the years having all six of your daughters leave the village? For years, women have been at a disadvantage here. While men were allowed to marry outside the village and bring their wives in, women were not, forcing them to leave to find love. In the past decade, the village has shrunk by a third as the old die and the young leave. Yeah, I don't think it'll be much longer for this whole entire place is a ghost town. As darkness descends, the threat from North Korea rises. The soldiers go door to door to check everyone safely inside. The villagers need permission to leave their homes after 7 o'clock. <laughs> this curfew is the most restrictive part of village life. As a young couple with two small children, the Shin family is unusual. Misun met Gyung Ho at a party and he convinced her to move in. Do you think young people can be convinced to stay here? Their children attend the village primary school. There are so few children that most pupils are bussed in from outside. What do you like about living here? Jane An increasing number of South Koreans no longer believe in reunification or even want it. And as this dream dies, it's getting harder to convince people to live here on the front line of a conflict that might never be resolved. This <laughs> so this video here is why South Korean women aren't having babies. This has been hitting the news. I didn't know this when I was born, but I was born in a school. I didn't know how much I was going to get to the school. Is it 100? Is it 100? Why don't I go to the school? I don't know. I'm not 
한국에서는 노동이 어려워요. 이게 거의 책바퀴처럼 굴러가는 일상이고 주말에는 진짜 링거 맞고 누워있는 정도로 살, 삶을 유지해야 되는 어. 직장을 그만두는 여성들이 정말 많다. 아이 때문에 메인 아나운서들도 애를 낳으러 갈때 어, 직업을 포기하고 가는구나. 그리고 다시 돌아오지 않거든요. 나도 저렇게 아이 I think a lot of people are having that discussion. We did a video not too long ago about a couple saying that it, it just isn't in their plans right now to have, have a kid. They'd rather work on their careers, get their lives in order, whatever that is, you know? So, and it, it's nothing wrong with this. I feel like people are being pressured into marriage and having kids, and it's not what they want to do. Do what you want to do. <laughs> 직장을 포기해야 되는 걸까? 이거 30리터라고? 30리터? 어때? 이걸로 절대 안 돼. 저 이거 런던 <웃음> 20일 갈 때도 이거에 두 개였어. 이거 런던. 뉴질랜드로 가게 된 이유는 어, 뉴질랜드가 성차별 임금이 가장 낮은 여성의 인권이 좀 높은 순위에 들어가다 보니까 <웃음> 한국에서도 살아남았는데 외국 나가서 왜못 살겠어? 여기보다 더 지옥이 있을까 싶기도 해요. 조그만 아이들은 너무 귀여워. 아이들의 귀여운 모습을 보면 낳고 싶다가도 어떻게 교육을 해야 되는지 그거를 이제 가르친 사교육계 입장으로서는 너무 원산이다. 어, 어 진짜 다 맞았네. 와, 웰다. 그러니까 아이들 영수 기본 하잖아요. 영수만 기본 해도 거의 욕심 나가죠. 돈 얘기 다 해야 돼? <웃음> 돈 얘기 해야 돼? 발레, 뭐 태권도, 운동. Not yet. And then that's the crazy part. Because growing up, sometimes your parents, and you see how she included sports, taekwondo, different extracurricular activities. Growing up, a lot of people's parents can't afford to put them in certain things, Taekwondo. I tried to put my kids in Taekwondo one time. Bro, that thing was expensive. And I started out with the like the little trial they do to draw you in. They give you like the super, super discount. But then once you sign up, that next month it roll over and all those fees really kick in. You're looking at this like, man, I'm paying, like it's costing me what I'm paying in rent to send my kids. to this extra curricular activity. You're like, man, how, how? I can't afford this. So I get that, bro. I get that it was a struggle to try to find different ways, man, to try to keep them active. Dick. 아이를 키운다는 것은 엄마가 전적으로 그 아이한테 헌신해야 되고 사랑을 줘야 되는데 어, 저는 아직까지는 그릇이 부족한가 봐요. 저는 제가 더 좋아요. <웃음> 만약에 집에서 아이만 본다면 굉장히 우울할 것 같아요. 이렇게 되었어. 잘했네. 와 이게 뭐야? 악기? 굉장히 이제 고립된 육아를 하게 됐죠. 쉽지 않았고 도움을 받을 수 있는 것도 많이 없었고 또 남편은 일이 많은 사람이었고 How much of the childcare and the housework do you do compared to your husband? I'm about three years old. Do you understand why women now are choosing not to have children. And it, it's for reasons like that. It's the fear of losing yourself. A lot of women feel like they lose themselves and then they start resenting the children and they don't want to feel like that. Who wants to feel like that? You want to be just as ambitious as you, you always were. But when you have kids, a lot, of, a lot of your goals and ambitions takes a back seat. So some people are seeing that and their eyes are open and they're like, man, I, this ain't what, this ain't for me right now. 
I still got things in life I want to achieve, attain, and do. I still got career goals. So this is why a lot of people are choosing to be like, nah, not right now. Maybe not ever. 당연히 그 선택을 안 하죠. 자기는 일을 잃게 되고 아이 아이 키우는 거는 오직 자기의 몫이 되는 이 사회 구조 속에서 어 약자가 될수 없는 밖에 없는 길을 왜 굳이 가겠어요? <웃음> What is the biggest thing that needs to change here in South Korea to make this more appealing for women? 노동 시간의 단축인 것 같아요. 한국은 정말 전 세계적으로 막 길게 일하는 나라잖아요. 안 쉬고 길게 일하는 나라. 뭔가 조금 여유를 가질 수 있는 시간이 되는 문화가 일단은 대, 그게 제일 먼저라는 생각이 들고 두 번째는 이 아이를 같이 키울 수 있는 누군가의 도움을 받을 수 있는 제도가 저는 너무 필요하다고 생각해요.